Um, tonight, I'm happy to introduce to you Belmont, uh, our very own Belmont science fiction fantasy author, uh, Patrick Duffy, who writes under the pen name J. Patrick Black. Um, he will be talking tonight about his first debut novel, Night City Burning, which was just published in September to much acclaim. Um, it was selected as Barnes & Noble's Best Science Fiction and Fantasy for September. It also made Amazon's list for best, fic um, best books of the month under the um, science fiction and fantasy genre. And it was uh, also highlighted by um, several websites, io9, The Verge, and Goodreads. I just want to go into a little detail about Patrick's background because I think it's very interesting. Um, so off often um, there's a disconnect between the idea of becoming a writer and the reality of the talent, the sheer commitment and determination it actually takes to become a writer. And uh, along the way, Patrick has worked in many occupations while simultaneously uh, writing his novels. And um, I think that's so rewarding to see that he is now um, able to be a full-time author and, um, and uh, he is not only uh, just finished a book tour for Night City Burning, but he's also currently working on a new book. So with no further delay, please welcome author uh, Patrick Duffy, uh, pen name J. Patrick Black. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, I am still not great with microphones, so if at any point you can't hear me, just make, a, make some kind of motion, um, and I will try to figure it out. Um, thank you, Gretchen, for the introduction. Um, I guess folks didn't know that they were here with uh, Robert Heinlein tonight <laughs> also, but um, an Orson Scott card. An Orson Scott yeah. card. So, <laughs> I, I'm definitely very pleased to be uh, to be mentioned in that kind of that kind of company. Um, what I thought I'd do is just uh, talk a little bit about the book, introduce it, and then maybe read a, um, a short excerpt that lasts about ten minutes, and then uh, answer some questions, and we'll take it from there. Um, so, uh, as I believe has been mentioned once or twice, uh, Ninth City Burning is my first novel. Um, it's been out for roughly two months. Uh, it's a um, science fiction fantasy blend uh, set 500 years after an invasion of Earth by a mysterious alien force. Now, um, as aliens do when they invade Earth, uh, these ones came wielding an uh, unusual level of technology. Um, but this was not the sort, of, uh, the sort of technology that might have evolved from things like the, the wheel and fire and gone through internal combustion engines and superconductors. It, it looked and acted a lot like magic. And for that reason, it was um, more than we could handle, more than we were able to uh, defend against, until it turned out that we could hijack this power and use it for ourselves. So when the story begins, this war has been going on for 500 years. Um, the entire planet is... Uh, putting all of its resources into fighting back into um, a kind of mysterious distant war far away from Earth. Uh, society is divided into three parts. There are the cities, which are responsible for maintaining the war, for defending um, the planet. There are settlements, which uh, provide most of the supplies in terms of food and uh, material and soldiers, mostly. And then there's everyone else. Um, these are the people who either um, refused to take part in the war or just never knew about it, ended up as sort of, you know, post-apocalyptic, um, isolated uh, wanderers. So the piece that I thought I'd read from uh, is from one of the, the city dwellers. Uh, his name is Jax, and he is a, um, a newfound uh, wielder of this uh, mysterious alien power. Um, so I'll get right into that now, and then we can, uh, we can talk about the rest. Chapter one, we're only a few minutes into our quiz when the sirens start, and the first thing I feel is relief, even though I know that's totally wrong, totally not how I should feel. 
I can still remember the panic, the terror that used to come over me when I heard the atmospheric incursion siren, the, city, the signal that our city is under attack. And I know that's how all the kids around me must be feeling this very second, but it's different for me now. Once the first shock of the wailing siren passes, it's true I'm afraid too, but isn't the same kind of fear I used to feel. It's more like fear of letting everyone down. And even that's not so bad yet, though I know it's going to get worse. But for a moment, just a moment, there was that relief because I'm totally not prepared for this quiz, which I know is crazy because what kind of person is like, oh great, I won't have to take a quiz because everybody is going to die. I'm not a bad student really, even in biology, which is the subject of this quiz, which is about photosynthesis, which is how plants turn sunlight into energy. The trouble is, whenever I sit down to study, I end up picking up the Academy Handbook. It isn't a long book, but each time I flipped back to the beginning, like maybe if I read it one more time, I'll find the answer I need. Like maybe I just missed it the other hundred million times. But even though the handbook has all the rules for life at the Academy, it doesn't tell me the one thing I really need to know. Oh, and there's nothing about photosynthesis either. Pencils down, cadets. That's Dan E, our writer. Everyone in sixth class section E has her for biology, physics, and irrational mechanics. She's been pacing down the rows of desks, looking over our shoulders one by one, but at the sound of the siren, she walked into the front of the room. In line by the door, please, she says, her voice calm, almost cheerful, like this is just another lesson. All around, there's the sound of chairs creaking from beneath desks. Near the back of the room, a girl gives a little squeal of panic. Her pencil is still scribbling away. She smacks it down like someone swatting a fly, then glances up to see if anyone's noticed. We all have, including Redder Danny, who gives the girl, uh, who takes the girl by the hand and leads her to the front of the line of cadets forming by the door. Using an artifice pencil during any kind of test is totally against the rules, as anyone who'd even picked up the Academy Handbook would know. On a normal day, this girl would be in for some pretty big time trouble, but not today. Redder Danny, who's usually pretty tough, gives the girl's hand a reassuring squeeze before ushering her into line. If they're still alive tomorrow, they can talk about punishment then. I'm cadet 6E12, meaning 6th class, section E, seat 12, so I take my place 12th from the door. As I walk down the line, I can feel the other cadets watching me, not staring because you're supposed to be face forward when you're in formation, but from the corners of their eyes. My uniform is the same gray as any other cadets, and on my collar I have the same six black pips as everyone in 6th class, but there isn't a person in this city who would mistake me for a normal kid. The symbol I wear at my neck, a golden circle with a second circle inside, is just a reminder. During school hours, everyone is expected to pretend like I'm just another student at the academy, but that's all they can really do, pretend. Over the past few months, I've gotten used to everyone's looking at me differently, gotten used to setting off whispers everywhere I go. It isn't like people are mean to me. If anything, they're extra, extra nice. Actual officers will stop and salute me or congratulate me or ask me to shake their hand. I've made a lot of friends since starting at the School of Rhetoric, and my friends from before are still my friends. The kids in Section E seem proud to have me, usually, but not today. Today, things are different. Today, everyone's nervous. They know that in a little while, their lives could depend on me. Of all the 11 and 12-year-olds who came back from sequester, I'm the only one who turned out to be Fontani, and as the youngest Fontanus in the city, it's my job to stand for all of us during an attack. The last line of defense. In 10 minutes, all of Ninth City could be gone, and I will have to fight to protect whoever is left. And that's the look the cadets are giving me now. They're wondering if they can trust me with their lives, this kid with his long nose and curly dirt brown hair, who's somehow skinny and a little pudgy at the same time, who's in the bottom of his class in chin-ups and push-ups and don't even ask about the five-kilometer run, who's never been really, really good at anything. They're seeing the same jacks they've known for 12 years, only now I'm supposed to protect them from complete destruction. Even Redder Danny seems tense. I don't blame them. I wish they didn't have to depend on me either. When all the cadets of Section E are in line, Danny opens the door, and we file out of the classroom, forming two columns of 10, everyone moving smoothly in time. Each of us has been doing atmos atmospheric incursion drills practically since we learned to walk. As our section, our best time is classroom to shelter in three minutes and 42 seconds. It's also so familiar, I almost forget this is the real thing, but only almost. The Hall of East Wing is filled with sections just like ours, kids walking calmly two by two with a redder at the front. The redders stand out by their black legionnaires' uniforms and because they're older, most around 20 years old like Danyi. 
Some of the writers for the upper classes are even older than that, but not for the dodos, which is the general academy term for sixth classers. The rumor is that writers aren't allowed to teach younger kids anymore once they've been on their first tour. No one speaks or looks anywhere but straight ahead. The only sound is the rhythmic clacking of our academy dress shoes and the wail of the attack siren. The siren is an artifice designed so that it's nearly impossible to ignore, a sound that seems to come right out of the air like water gathering on the side of a glass. I wonder sometimes whether it could be an actual wail like someone really screaming. That's how artifices are. No matter how precisely they're designed, you can never really be sure what they'll do. We follow the flow of cadets down the wide stone stairway of East Wing as far as the ground floor. But where everyone else continues on to the lower levels, Danny leads us to the main foyer. She brings us to a halt in front of a tall stone arch, like the threshold of a huge doorway blocked with a massive slab of white stone, its translucent surface faintly glowing with the light outside. Section E adjutant, she says, turning to face us. Report. Alessa leaves her place in the column to stand out front. Cadet adjutant Alessa reporting, ma'am, she says, six class section E, all present and in good condition. On our first day of the School of Rhetoric, when Danu told us to elect a section adjutant, everyone was sure it would be Bomar. On the school's entrance evaluations, Bomar scored higher than anyone in our, in our section in leadership. 97th percentile, he would say, about 10 times a day, just in case anyone forgot. Bomer decided his high score meant anything he wanted to do was automatically good leadership. At lunch, he liked to order people to give him their dessert rations for the good of the section. Alessa was the first one to say what we all already knew, that school would be miserable with Bomer as adjutant. After that, the choice was obvious. Alessa is smart and organized, and she can do an insane number of chin-ups. When the vote came in, she won 19 to 1. Alessa always seems to know what to do. She would have made a good Fontana, I bet. Instead, Ninth City got me. Section E is yours, Danny tells Alessa. Take your cadets to East Wing Shelter and report to your Centurio aspirant. Yes, ma'am, Alessa turns to face us. Cadets with me, she says and sets off. The other cadets of Section E follow until only I am left. Danny gives me a small nod and an even smaller smile, then approaches the arch with its huge wall of stone. As she does, a dark shape appears on the white surface, the outline of a man. <coughs> like the shadow of someone standing on the other side. It holds up one arm, waving at us to stop, and a voice comes out of the wall. An atmospheric incursion alert is an effect, it says, deep and booming, and sort of echoing in the same way as the sirens still wailing through the air. The Academy of Ninth City is closed until further notice. All personnel are to report to their designated shelters. This is not a drill. The voice pauses a moment, then begins its message again. <coughs> but stops when Danny places her palm against the white stone. Redder Danny of the Academy, she says, escorting Fontanus Jackson to the forum. The voice stops, then after a moment it says, pass. All at once the wall of white vanishes like clearing mist, and we're looking out onto a courtyard of stone paths and wide lawns, <laughs> empty and bright beneath a cloudy sky. The door be reappears behind us as soon as we're outside. I don't hear it happen, but when I look back, it's there. Danny has taken a small metal disc from her pocket. It's a, stor it's a storage device, I know, made to hold artifices and given to her for the sole purpose of bringing me to the forum during an attack. Oh, and given me to, for the sole purpose of bringing me to the forum during an attack. I could get there just as fast by myself, but the academy can be very strict and sometimes kind of unreasonable when it comes to what cadets are and aren't allowed to do on their own. I actually kind of like it better this way. Ready, cadet, Danny asks. I think she might actually be nervous, but I can't tell for sure. Ready, ma'am, I say. Danny passes two fingers over the surface of the disc, and suddenly everything is a blur, the ground rushing beneath us like wind, walkways and stairways and hallways whirling around us with the speed of a cyclone. When the world settles back again, Danny and I are standing in front of another stone archway, easily twice as tall as the last one, opening onto a wide stone plaza. I feel Danny's hand settle onto my shoulder. We pass beneath the arch, and she steps back and salutes. This is as far as I go, sir, she says. This whole procedure is in my handbook, part of a special appendix added just for me. It always feels weird when adults address me as sir, but now that we're off academy grounds, I outrank Danny by quite a bit. Yes, ma'am, I say, returning the salute. I'll take it from here. But instead of leaving, Danny kneels and hugs me hard. Good luck, sir, she whispers. We're all rooting for you. The hug takes me completely by surprise. Nowhere in the handbook, not even in the special appendix, does it mention hugging. 
let alone hugging a superior officer. As far as I know, hugging is completely non-regulation. I mumble something that sounds like, thanks, and Danny lets me go, smiling sadly. She salutes once more, and then she's gone in a gust of wind. End of chapter one. There are 65 more where that came from. <laughs> so I know some people here have read the book, um, but if uh, you know if anybody has questions about anything that has um, you know, occurred in that chapter or anywhere else, feel free to ask um, while I continue to mop myself up. <laughs> Yeah, yes? What made you want to write um, from so many different perspectives and different characters? Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, <laughs> what was the question again? Yeah. So um, why did I, so this is, uh, there are a lot of different, um, uh, different narrators in this novel. There are actually seven different perspective characters. Uh, and uh, the question was, why did I choose to do that? Um, and um, one of the reasons was to, to keep myself entertained. It's a long book with a lot of plot, and um, it was sort of it was a it was a challenge to be able to um, try to come up with a different, unique voice for each of the different characters. Uh, at the same time, I thought it was um, the right choice for the story in that um, there are so many different uh, sides to the action, and everybody, uh, all the different characters, have their own perspectives, their own. Um, points of view, their own prejudices that really color what's going on. And being able to see each of them from the perspective of the others, um, I think, really adds a lot of uh, complexity to the story. Did you map out all 65 chapters and then fill it in, or did it just kind of flow? Uh, yes and no. So um, there were probably three drafts that, that went into this in total. and. Um, as I mentioned, there are a number of different um, different perspectives and different characters, and I would generally write each one of them as sort of their own short story. Um, and by the time I was done with that, there were probably about 18 chapters, something like that, and I realized that they were much, much too long <laughs> for anyone to, to sit down and write, so I sat down and uh, divided them up. But really, it, was, it began as um, much, much longer pieces that were um, kind of woven together and that it, you know, they, they, they gain a lot of um, momentum towards the end, but in the beginning, it's, um, they really are sort of a separate adventures, I think, that, that, that come together. Does an editor help you in that process? I mean, or did you? Yes, very much. Do you have an isolation? I mean, so so um, the answer to both questions is yes. Uh, so I, I originally wrote the story you know, as more or less completely privately. It was writing as my hobby. Um, and I know a lot of family and friends know that I do it, but um, you know, it's not something that I would foist upon them to, to read. So really the first um, people who saw this in a complete form were the, um, the agents that I queried to try to get representation to actually sell this to publishers. Um, and so when I signed with an agent, we did uh, a round of editorial work. Um, and agents vary on the amount of editorial work that they like to do, but the one I had was was very good in that regard. Um, so you know we did we did a good amount of work um, on this before it went out to publishers, and then um, once I found an, an editor at an actual publishing house, we we went through it again. So um, from beginning to end, it was probably about two years uh, all taken, and I was only working on my own for about one of those. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, in the Good Goodreads review, it mentions that you're, I think that's where I read it. I don't know. I've read so many things about you, Mr. Black. Um, <laughs> but are you writing another book now? I Is am. Is this a sequel to this? The, yes. And so uh, I'm actually on for two more books in this same series. Um, I was writing book two about three hours ago before I came here. So it's, uh, it's, some some ways from being complete, but um, I, I will get it to you eventually. I, it will not be a uh, George R. R. Martin sort of hiatus between books. I'm hoping. Yes. And in what year does the story take place? Uh, it is it is unspecified, but um, at least at least five centuries from now, um, probably a little bit more than that. But it's uh, the the um, the sort of kind of 
moment where the, the world of the story departs from our own is five centuries before the story begins. So the world has had time to, to change quite a bit. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I suppose it's sort of a spoiler alert that I've already told you that it's Earth, but uh, you, don't, you don't really figure that out until a couple of chapters into the, the novel, unless, you know, you're, you're very, very perceptive. Which I'm sure you all are. Yes? In uh, developing so many different characters, did you find that you eventually had a favorite or one that you identified with? Um, I, I usually, um, the answer is, is yes, but in different ways. Um, because I, I think I tried to give each of the characters sort of a piece of something that I, that I could kind of latch onto that you know, I would personally identify with. But yes, there, there are some that are some that I identify more or less with in the story, um, and uh, some that I find easier and uh, more natural to write. Oh, hi. Yeah, yes. You mentioned George R. R. Martin, and of course, uh, his, um, his Song of Ice and Fire is written in a similar way in the mm -hmm. sense of it, different chapters being narrated by a different character. And, did you feel that that influenced you to do it, or is it a completely independent decision? Oh, ab absolutely, um, I would say. I mean, I, um, his, his books kind of convinced me that, that fantasy was really something that was still worth reading and writing. Um, so yeah, I would definitely consider that an influence sort of on the, the conception of this book and, and the, the style with which I did it. Um, the difference, I guess, is that uh, this is, these stories are written in the first person rather than the third person. Um, and the chapters tend to be a little bit um, longer within the perspective of one character. But yes, he was definitely a, a strong influence. And if I could add a second question, um, just from what you read us, which is a chapter one, and I guess just one of the, the narrate, narrative characters, but it sounds to me like it would be classified as YA. Is that true? Or so they, um, they, the publisher did not classify it as YA. Um, why people seem to like it, uh, but the, the the character that I read from in the beginning was, um, you know, he's a, I guess a preteen is the way he was, 12 years old, um, and there is one other character of that age group, but all of the other ones are late teens, early 20s, um, and of course there are, and those are just the perspective characters. This is, it's it's sort of a world where people tend to not live for a very long period of time, so for that reason, um, most people tend to be relatively young, um, but there are, um, you know, there's a variety of characters. There's one who uh, is, I guess, technically, you know, 550 years old, um, but is probably more in his mid-40s uh, in terms of uh, appearance and experience. So, you know, it, it goes all over the place, but, um, like I said, I, I, we have had good good response from YA readers. Yes. Question about pacing. When you're writing a novel or a series uh, about planetary or larger events, things either tend to happen very quickly and be over comprehensively, or take a lot of time. How do you do? How do you do epic level stuff and still keep the reader at tight focus? So I think, um, at least in the case of, of this book, and so I can only really speak from the perspective of this one, it's um, the, the war in the story is up until the beginning of the, of the book, a war of attrition. You know, it's really nothing is happening. And so I, the reason I chose to set the book when I did um, is that this is the point where things are happening. So it's, um, even though it's, there's a, a long scale of things going on, there's sort of a, a tipping point where things are being decided um, and where everything is happening at once. So that, at least I thought, would make for an interesting story. Yes? Uh, talking about who your readers are or might be, and uh, it reminds me a little bit of Ender's Game in the sense you have the children and the academy, and, right. and would you consider that an influence as well, or were you thinking of those as, as being your potential readers? Um, yes, so I think um, you know Ender's Game is one of my all-time favorites, um, and I think it's one that has you know it's it's influenced a, more than one generation of science fiction readers, and you know people who have discovered these types of books when they were when they were younger are definitely um, I 
at least I would hope, um, would become, you know, be willing to come back to something that recalled that, you know, that, that moment in their, uh, their reading experience. So I, I think um, a lot of readers today don't fall as, as neatly into categories and in that, you know, we've all, I, I started as a, you know, a middle grade reader and I'm now technically an adult um, and I still happily read <laughs> things from all of those genres. So, um, you know, for, I think for, especially for people who are willing to kind of reach back and, and find a, a younger self, this is, a, I think this would be a pleasurable read. Hi. Hi. So first of all, congratulations on your first novel. Oh, thank That's you. huge. And love that you're from Belmont, so we'd love to hear that story. Um, I had put your book on my Goodreads list, I don't know how I found it. Right. And it came in for me from the library here like a week ago. And then I'm always on our site, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's coming. <laughs> so I'm only at 150. Okay. And um, I'm really enjoying it. I love the, the sci-fi, I read a lot of YA genre. Sure. Because I think it's exciting and good character development. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting because I read the plot, it was aliens, and it's only around 150 that you start to understand there is this alien. What was the reason for that? Um, I, I was fine with it. I was like, oh, he's really taking his time because you don't really understand what's going on. So that, Not in a bad way. You no, no, that's, it's, it's, it's very, no, it's, it's interesting to hear from the perspective of somebody who's, uh, who's encountered it as a reader because the, the summary did not exist when I wrote the book. I just sort of set out to write a story, and I, I had this idea. Um, I wanted to do kind of a, a science fiction fantasy mashup. Um, and the way I had been thinking of writing it, it, there would be you know a little bit of uncertainty, a little bit of mystery to kind of what the the background story is. And you don't really get that. You're probably not there yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Um, and I, you know, I thought that would be sort of a cool, um, a cool experience for the reader that there would be an interesting reveal to sort of what the the background of the of the world is. And um, then we sold the book, and we had to, and and the, you know, the publisher said, you know, we want it to be, a, we want to give it a real sci-fi feel. Um, if you see the cover, there are little spaceships on it. I had not, you know, thought that was necessarily gonna <laughs> gonna be the way they would go with it, but. Um, you know, they had a they had a strong vision for how they wanted to market it, and um, that's what you got. So I'm I'm glad it kind of came together for you that you know it ended up in your reading list, and then all of a sudden yeah. I'll claim that I didn't plan that. But and then what's your Belmont story? Because I don't know if anybody attended the Jason Gay a couple months ago uh, event. He's the Wall Street Journal uh, sports writer who wrote his first book, and it was great just to be here and hear his growing up experience and his English teacher here here and. You know, just I'm sure we're all from Belmont here, just to hear what, what your story is. Yes, so there's, um, there's a strong contingent of people who, uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, at least one teacher. So, uh, so I grew up on, um, originally on Lexington Street, um, right near the uh, Watertown border. Um, moved to Concord Avenue later on. I attended Belmont Day School. Um, which people probably drive through on their morning commutes. Um, and then I went to BBNN over in Cambridge. Um, so, you know, I played a lot of second soccer league. Uh, I was a, I was a um, referee for it, which uh, doesn't relate directly to my writing, but gave me a strong understanding of conflict. Um, um, you know, I, I have always been impressed with the, you know, the literary, um, tradition of Belmont. I read Tom Perota's books before I knew that he lived there. And then I don't know if anybody here has read Little Children. And like that pool over there is yeah, is featured in it. Yeah, yeah it's. So it's, it, it, you know, and, and that that was, you know, one of the things that, you know, helped me help kind of motivate me to, to you know, keep at it because that, you know, there's it's it's cool to be around um, that kind of local scene. It's really exciting. Um, and so now I actually still uh, hang out in Belmont from time to time. I, um, I also, in addition to writing, work as a real estate developer. And so um, I'm doing something out on Concord Avenue. You probably drive by it pretty, pretty frequently if you commute, commute on, uh, if you use Concord Ave to commute. So um, if you're around there, stop by, say hi. <laughs> you can, actually, when we're finished with the road, you can stop by and say hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, do you have any advice on any young uh, new authors on how to market uh, their, their books uh, going through what you've gone through? 
Yes. Uh, so first, first step is um, have my mother be your mother because <laughs> 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 she, she, she's probably my, my primary um, marketing contact. Uh, I, I think she was the one who, who contacted the, the Belmont paper, which uh, got me an article there and I think led to me being here. Um, so there, there is a small success story right there. Um, I, would, I would say learn how to use social media. Um, I am still not great at it, but I'm trying. Um, and I think probably the, uh, the biggest piece of advice I would have is just to be willing to get out and do a lot of legwork, meet people, um, have some cards made up, but be, be will willing to go to conferences and literary events because there are always a lot of people there who love to talk about writing. And I think that's, um, that's kind of the one thing that you know, if, you're, if you're a writer or if you're a reader, you're going to have in common. Finding a good agent would be also a Finding a good agent is, yes, that is, that is definitely an important part of it. Uh, that took me a long time. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's the sort of thing where if, if, you're, if you're out there and meeting people, you, you really increase your chances. Um, I was not one of the lucky ones who got my agent in some sort of, you know, interesting, miraculous way, like meeting them at a restaurant or something like that. I kind of, I did it the old-fashioned way, well, using the internet. So not quite the old-fashioned way, but you know, um, the more traditional way. Did you specifically look for agents um, that represent speculative fiction? And if so, how did you determine which ones to approach? So um, I wasn't looking specifically for speculative fiction. I had, I, have, I had a book that I wrote before this that I was looking for representation on that I met a lot of agents um, that liked it but didn't think they could sell it. So when I came back with another book, I started with the agents that already had said they liked my work. Um, and so this time around, it, things went a lot more quickly. Um, but I think the, the best way to seek out agents is to look in the back of books that you like. Um, and usually, you know, a happy writer will, will mention their agent. I know I did. Um, and, you know, you can then go to their website and send them a letter and keep your fingers crossed. There's a lot of finger crossing that goes on when you're submitting books. Oh, yes. I loved hearing you read your book. And I think an author has a, you know, just a real connection, of course, to the, the story and, and can put inflection where inflection should be. Um, are there any plans to create a it already exists. <laughs> it, 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 not only does it exist, it has a full cast. So um, there are, you, you have all of the narrators. Uh, there are some, some narrators in this, in this book that I really like, but I shied away from actually reading from because they are females, and I didn't think I could really pull off a female from the first person in my own voice. Um, <laughs> So, but the, so the audiobook readers are fantastic. Um, I've listened to the audiobook. It's, it's really great. Um, and there's one of the characters in the, in the book that uses uh, footnotes in her narration, and they handle that pretty well uh, in, the, in the audiobook, um, which is not a simple task. So I applaud them for that as well. A character who narrates in footnotes. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> yes. Have you had interest from movie interests? Um, so the answer to that, I would say, is sort of. Um, I have a rights agent, which is different from a um, normal literary agent, who, you know, is trying to find people to turn it into something. Um, unless he's being very cagey with me, there hasn't been any deals on that so far. But uh, you know, you never know. It's more of the finger crossing I mentioned. Yes. Patrick, did your agent? Um, want you to have a pen name, or did you do that on your own? So that was, um, I would say it was a group decision. Uh, a lot of it had to do with my publisher, which is, so the, the publisher is Ace Books, um, which is a, uh, a uh, division of Penguin Random House, and they have a lot of um, authors with my various other names already. They have a James Duffy, they have a um, Patrick, or a James Patrick, um, and you know, they, there's also a, uh, a slightly more famous Patrick Duffy that some people might have heard of. Um, 
so, uh, well, and so when I was on my book tour, um, I stayed at this one hotel that was, uh, it was sort of known for um, having authors stay there. And they had a, they had a library um, filled with books signed by authors who had stayed at this hotel. And so when I got there, there was a letter for me uh, that said, oh, um, Mr. Duffy, we're so pleased to have you staying at our hotel. If you would please sign this copy of Man from Atlantis by Patrick Duffy, um, we would be very pleased to have it in our library. And so um, I wasn't sure if I was being punked or what exactly was going on, but uh, I eventually figured out that Patrick Duffy, the actor, had written a novel called The Man from Atlantis the exact same year. And not only that, had been um, to the bookstore that I was signing at that night and signed his book. Um, so, Pat, Patrick Duffy, like Dallas, has, he, he wrote a novel based on his character from, um, a, I believe, the 1960s television show about uh, an underwater man. Um, <laughs> and, and he had been to the bookstore ahead of me and signed his book. So I bought a copy of it there and gave it to the hotel so that they would have it there. Um, but so that's, that's another reason. He gets much many more Google hits than I do. Um, <laughs> I was also recommended to choose a name that had a B uh, as its first letter because that gets you in a nice place on the science fiction shelves. Um, uh, Ray Bradbury, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Asimov, it's just a nice area to be in. Um, so so uh, yes, a lot, of, a lot of thought went into it. Um, there, there was a lot of, ac actually, uh, Belmont was one of the alternative last names that I was thinking about choosing, but um, my publisher told me not to because it would be obviously fake uh, because, <laughs> because I would go to events like this and people would say, oh, that's an interesting coincidence. They're... And you'd be accused of taking it from the Castle Landing franchise. Yes, exactly. I didn't want to have to face down those types of criticisms. Yes. So does it feel weird not to have your name on it? I know for all the reasons you said that makes total sense, but does it feel weird to have this quote, or does it feel good or bad? Like, does it feel weird that people wouldn't just know it's you, your friends or people? Yeah. I mean, mo most of my friends have figured it out by now. Um, and I, I think it's cool to have a secret identity. I, I enjoy it. Um, I, get, I get a different Facebook account, so I can, you know, I get, I get to have two, two people I can be online. It's, um, yeah, it, it allows me to sort of uh, keep things distinct and it's easier for me to figure out what's going on. If, if I get spam email, you know, I, I know who it's for. Um, yeah. Yes. Patrick, I'm sorry, Patrick. Um, yes, we do. I remember you in high school. Um, <laughs> when did you start to, did you ever have Brian Stavely as a teacher? No, I don't think so. Don't need to follow that up. Okay. You would have liked him, though. Um, but uh, he also left and became a writer oh. you, and then he's written trilogy and so forth. But um, when did you start to feel like, hey, I got this in me here. I just want, I have to do this. Was it as was it later in college or? Yeah. So I, or? I didn't really get into it in. Um, until college, I, as you would know, oops, as you'll remember, I, I did some writing in high school, um, but uh, the 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 fiction, um, yeah, I, I tried I tried doing a a, a story workshop um, when I was I think a sophomore or junior in college, and I you know I wrote a story that people liked, and I was like, wow, this is great. I let's let's see about doing this for a living, and then you know, 13 years later, uh, <laughs> here I am. Um, but yeah, I, I think you know it's it's the sort of thing that um, I always wanted to try, but didn't really get into until I you know was was a little bit older, um, and I was an English major already, so I was bar I was buried in books, and you know eventually you kind of think well. Well, yes. there's a quick follow-up question that yes. also relates to this guy Stately, if you don't know. But um, I asked him when he was writing his books, how much of it do you get visual? It's visual, and how much of it is just compelled, you know, or born out of the characters and what they're saying and their actions. So I would say, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure for everybody it's a little bit different, but um, for me, I usually, the, the visual parts tend to be sort of the more dramatic and pyrotechnic scenes, um, but I think most of it develops 
um, out of the, the words being used. And I think, you know, in a, that's, that's at least been true for, for this book in particular because so much of it is about the voice of the characters. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of what I'm writing I don't really figure out until I actually sit down to write it, which of course means that I have to go back and rewrite it because by the time I get to the end, it's different from when I started off. So um, for, in, for me at least, it, it grows out in that, in that way. Yes? Uh, if it makes sense to ask, which were you first aware of? A character idea, a plot idea, a world idea? What, what was the first real piece of it that you were aware, OK, story? So um, I think in the case of this particular book, that's a really pertinent question, because there are um, it really began as sort of different pieces of different stories that I didn't really think were related to each other, either for a character or for a concept, um, or for you know some some kind of uh, magical note to add to a world. And they were separate, right? And they, and they you know these would have developed at different times, um, and it wasn't until I had the idea for um, actually the the character who I just read and one other one who turned out to be kind of the the linchpin characters that could tie all of these other pieces together that it really turned into a story. So before that, it could have been you know, many, many short stories or, or concepts or um, sketches, but it's when you know, I had the idea for these specific characters that it turned into a real book. Yes? You said originally you didn't have an idea that they'd be like aliens or the origin of the enemy. You don't have to say what it is if it's coming out in later books, but do you have a backstory idea for where the aliens come from, their motives, et cetera, why they found Earth now? Yes, yeah, no, I, I've got, um, I, I have it. I actually, um, prob one of the, the earlier stories that ended up coming together to help make this novel um, is actually sort of from the alien world. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, this is the prequel to that. Um, so I, I won't leave you hanging is, okay. is the short answer. Okay. And if I do, you can come to my house and, we yeah. <laughs> I actually don't know where to <laughs> <laughs> You know where to find me at least. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you because your book was so compelling and it, um, your reading of it was so visual. Oh, thank um, you. It's really just, it, it sort of leads to, you know, see, you see it so visually you can imagine it being a movie. But I was going to ask a question which is um, related to your prior book that you said you were trying to get off the ground but you couldn't. And I'm wondering, how do you know when to stop on that and to start a new idea or to... I mean, that's a, that's a huge process, and I was just wondering how, as an author, you move from one idea to the next, and you're ready to move to that idea. That's a, that's a good question. I think it's, it's sort of, part of it is just the, the feel of it, right? You, you know, you've, um, you've gone through sort of a, and looking for an agent can be a very long process. You know, they, you know, you'll write a query letter and then they'll ask for part of the manuscript and then they'll ask for the whole manuscript and then they'll not say anything for a while and then they'll think about it. And so you go through that a couple of times and you get really close and you're like, okay, um, you know, you've experienced some disappointments and you think, well, maybe I'll just sort of set this aside for a time and, and try something else. And you know, I, you know, my, my previous books are ones that I, I may very well return to one day in a, in a different form, but it's, for, for me at least, um, starting something fresh is always a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, and I, I kind of make a point of um, <coughs> trying to start a new story every April Fool's Day, just as a, um, because I think it's a fitting way of getting into a piece of writing. And so this, this was one of those. And so, it, you know, it, it, went, it went forward, it worked out, and um, you know, I, I still think about those other books every now and then, uh, different ways I might be able to um, resurrect them and send them out back into the world. Did you always think of it as being a trilogy, or did that just come up as more of a marketing thing later on once you got hooked up with the agent and publisher? So, um, I, I wrote this as a, 
in a way, kind of creating a world that I could write as many stories in as I want. Um, and so I had an idea for a, you know, a three-book story arc. It's you know, a, um, a good way of telling a story. You've got a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and that was, uh, you know, when when I first pitched it to my agent, I didn't say, oh, I have three books planned. I just sent them this book. Um, and then you know, he called me up and said, I'm talking to a publisher, and how many books can you write in, in this? And I said, oh, I can write a lot if you want me to. Um, so you know, we, we came up with, with, with three as a good number, um, and that's the one they got. Yes? With the, the success that you've had in the sort of the modern age of instant feedback, have you allowed yourself to go down those rabbit holes, or do you ignore the press, or what's your sort of take on A, reviews, and B, like micro reviews in terms of like a comment section? So for the most part, I don't bother with them um, because, you know, I, I don't, I can't speak for other writers, but, you know, 10 great reviews, you know, really can, can be sort of overshadowed by one bad one. And, you know, it's write, writing a, a book that everybody likes is, or that, that anybody likes is, is difficult and writing one that nobody hates is pretty much impossible as far as I can tell. Um, but I, I do, you know, every once in a while, I, I pay attention to, or I have paid attention to, um, you know, sort of the, the more professional outlets, just because I kind of have to. They end up quoted on your website and your book. Um, but for the most part, um, a lot of the, the reviews that I end up listening to are the people who just email me until they tell me they liked it. That's, uh, you know, a more consistent audience, <laughs> in my opinion, is, are the ones who... Um, you, you have to reach a much higher level of success, I think, before people start writing you angry letters. Uh, but they'll write you nice letters right away. Yeah. Right, yeah. And so uh, there are a lot of characters, and it's a war, so that's. <laughs> so, Patrick, what keeps you inspired? That is an excellent question. <laughs> um, Do you know? just keep the creative process going and the juices flowing? How does all that kind of evolve and come out of you? It's, it's well, a pretty amazing gift, I well, think. Thank you, thank you. Um, right now it's deadlines. Uh, I, I, have, I have an editor who is uh, going on maternity leave in about a month, so she needs the second book by then because um, the baby is not going to wait for me to finish what I'm writing now so uh, I am I'm going to get it to her by then um, but and you know and then I will go for lots of long walks in the snow and have more brilliant ideas I hope sorry did they put any conditions on you the publisher or the editor did they say we want it longer we want it shorter we want it this that yeah. so um, not not very stringent ones um, the the editor that ended up buying this book bought it because she liked it, um, or got her publisher to buy it because she liked it. I don't exactly know how they decide. So at that point, you know, it was um, it was already kind of cut to her specifications, uh, and she mentioned um, before we we did the deal a couple of things that she thought um, you know she would like to see changed, and so most of them were not a problem for me at all. Um, but also they were they wanted to publish a book by me, so really I probably would have done almost anything that they asked. Um, but the uh, the requests that they made were were not very um, not very harsh, and so we'll see what she thinks of the second one. Um, but you know every um, edit editors are you know it's like it's like going to a doctor, right? They're very professional, um, and so and you know very wise in the ways of the publishing world. Um, so usually I, I listen to what my editor says because she's, she's smart and knows a lot. Sure. All right. Well, you know. um, okay. Yeah. So if, if, you're, if you're excited to get the signing, we can just talk after, but I, I'm happy to, to speak with you now, too. Yeah, um, a couple things. Um, I was wondering. I have heard it said that when you uh, query uh, a agent or whoever you're going to be querying it, that it's good to 
describe your book uh, in terms of other books that they've heard of that it's you know going to appeal to readers of you know, like, you know X Y and Z book mm -hmm. or it's like this but it's different in this way like do you believe in that at all or no is that not necessary? So I was going to ask if if somebody had told you to ask me this question because <laughs> my mine did uh, contain sort of a, a reference like that, which was, I, I described it as Ender's Game of Thrones. Uh, <laughs> so, I've been able to see that coming. Yes. Um, but, and, and that, I, that I, I think that helped me out. My, the agent I ended up signing with told me afterwards that he thought that was funny. Um, so, you know, at, at the very least, it didn't turn him off from the very beginning. But I think, um, I think especially for new writers, um, publishers find that very helpful to be able to compare you to somebody because otherwise, you know, you're just kind of this empty space that readers have to kind of take a flying leap into. Um, so if, and the second thing, um, there's a, you probably, uh, there's the latest thing going around on the internet or one of them, which is that, um, uh, I don't mean to get real political, but it says something about, uh, Post-apocalyptic fiction has now been moved to the current events section, and I say that only because I want to ask: Do you think that uh, the apocalyptic fiction, or whatever you want to call it, dystopian fiction, uh, do you think that's going to be popular for a while, or, or do you have any feeling for that? I, I think, in terms of, um, I mean, it, it, post-apocalyptic fiction, especially, has has been, you know, it, it really kind of got a lot of attention in the mid to late. 2000s or aughts, I'm not even sure what we're calling them at this point. Um, and has, you know, it's it's still really, um, it's, it's powered through until now. And, you know, in a lot of cases, we're just kind of seeing the movies based on the books that were written back then. Um, I think there's still a lot of room for stuff to be done, and, es and especially um, in sort of very kind of smaller, less epic ways, that, because um, that type of speculative fiction, I think, really allows you to kind of peel off a little piece of society and examine it in sort of an extreme and you know very interesting form. So I, I have a feeling that we're going to be seeing a, a lot more of those going forward. Okay, so that has legs in. That's not going away anytime. I, I would say so. I mean, I'm not in charge of buying books for a publisher, but um, if I was, I would probably buy some. Yeah. So I want to thank Patrick tonight. It was a pleasure. Thank you for coming out, everyone. Thank you.